Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm privileged to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School. Thank you for tuning into our Bible class. Today we continue our study of the book of Luke. Let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit, that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Last week, we heard of the faith of a Roman centurion who believed that Jesus could just say the word from a distance and his servant would be healed. Jesus commended him for his faith. Today, we continue on in Luke 7, beginning with verse 11. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. One day the citizens of this village received an unexpected visitor. It was God himself in the person of his son. He had not come to judge them or to put burdens on them, but to help them. The people were right when they said, God has visited his people. In other words, God has come to help us. And what happens when God comes to visit? Well, he finds people in their misery. When God's son became a man, he did not come to this earth in order to seek wealth and honor and the praise of men. Though he came to seek and to save those who were lost in sin, he came to join us in our misery. That brought him to people who were enslaved under the fear of death. Take this poor woman, for example. The dead person was the only son she had, and she has already lost her husband. As her precious son's body lay there cold, lifeless, and stiff, her problems went far beyond the sadness and grief that the sense of loss brings when a parent must bury her child. There were many practical problems that she faced. Where would she live? How could she earn an income to survive? Who would speak for her in the community? What future could there possibly be for her family? Jesus found her in misery. He saw it firsthand. He told her, do not weep. He had not come to condemn the world, which brought this curse of death on itself, but he came that the world through him might be saved. He came to help. He came to reverse the curse. God did not send his son in order that his son might deal with us according to our sins. No, he sent his son in order to deal with him according to our sins. God's own son came to help his people. He came to live a life in the valley of the shadow of death, to know pain and suffering and disappointment and inexplicable tragedy. Today, there's still people suffering under the curse of death. We recoil in horror over the latest murder or atrocity. Could God possibly know what it must be like for the, for the family of a murder victim? Well, actually, yes. This is exactly what God the Father experienced when his only son was betrayed, arrested, unjustly condemned and crucified. Can God know what it's like to lose your only son? Well, yes, actually God did experience that. Now, the idea of God visiting someone is a word used throughout the Bible. It means more than that God simply comes to be present. It means that God comes to look over everything and to take action. Sometimes he visits punishment upon people. That's when it says of God that he is visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. 
Why should the Lord of life, the creator of all things good, have to come into this world of death? Why should Christ come and share our mortal life? Indeed, he did not just witness mortality with his eyes, but also experienced it firsthand. In fact, the death he died was death tasted for all of humanity, for all humans of all time who took their first and last breaths under the curse of mortality. Yes, sometimes the word visitation is used of God allowing trouble to come to people. It's the trouble by which he drives us to seek God and therefore to grow in our faith. Years ago, when a natural disaster hit, people of faith would call it a visitation from God. In our town of New Minden, multiple such storms have hit over the years. After a disastrous cyclone in 1907 nearly destroyed the church building, when the church was finally rebuilt, the pastor prayed this in his prayer of dedication. He said, And we believe firmly without any doubts that you have visited us, not in your wrath, but in your fatherly love and grace. In other words, for the Christian, because God visited our sins upon Christ and he has taken away our sins, we don't have to fear that God is against us or angry with us. The sting has been removed. We look for blessings that God leaves behind for us. In some way, we believe it'll work for good. Most often, the visitation of God to his people is a time of God coming and acting for them. In the book of Genesis, we read that the Lord himself, accompanied by two angels, came to see Abraham and Sarah and promised them in their old age that in about a year, the Lord would return to them and she would give birth to a son. Sure enough, as the months went by, we read the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Genesis 21. Just before Joseph died in Egypt, he told his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, Genesis 50. He made them swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph's faith in the promises of God was not misplaced. At just the right time, some 400 years later, God visited the plagues upon the Egyptians and brought Israel out of slavery. So what we have in the coming of Christ is God's greatest visitation. After the birth of John the Baptist, when the age of salvation was being ushered in, John's father Zechariah sang, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Luke 1. And regarding the coming of Christ, still in the womb of Mary, he said, The day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Luke 1. When God visits his people, he brings the word of life. Jesus stops the procession, puts his hand on the bier, which was probably something like a stretcher with a body all wrapped up in cloths upon it. He touches that stretcher and simply says, young man, I say to you, arise. The young man sits up alive and begins to speak. He not only is alive, but he is well. Jesus gives him back to his mother. The creator who gave her this son in the first place now restores his creature for her. We can hardly imagine the shock, surprise, astonishment on that day just outside the village of Nain so long ago. Try to imagine it in modern terms. A funeral procession has just come out of the church and is on its way to the cemetery. A funeral crasher meets them on the road and somehow stops the procession. Maybe he stands in the middle of the road so they can't proceed. Once the hearse has stopped, he has them open up the rear of the car. The pallbearers are summoned to get out of their cars and take the casket out of the hearse right there in the middle of the road. Open it up, he says. The funeral director pulls out that little crank from his suit coat pocket and unlocks the lid. They open it up. The crasher says, hey there, young man, get up. And he does. What would happen next? The young man and his mother are reunited. What pandemonium! Everyone comes close, wants to see and touch and talk to the young man. 
And then all the funeral preparations have to be undone. The hole at the graveside needs to be filled up again. The vault and the casket will have to be returned. Can you get your money back for a returned casket? Who ever heard of such a thing? Well, Jesus is the ultimate funeral crasher. Every time we find him going to a funeral, he ends up putting an end to it. The sadness is turned to joy. There's death instead of life. Why, Jesus himself was laid in a borrowed tomb. He only needed it for a weekend. Jesus, the funeral crasher, the great death defeater, will come to the cemetery again. He will once again speak, Come out, I say to you, arise, and all the dead will be raised. And those who have believed in him will rise immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. They'll be like he is, body and soul, since he rose from the dead. Every last tragedy and visitation of death that has occurred will be rolled back once and for all. Hymn writer Herman Stimfel Jr. has written a hymn with two stanzas for each of the three occasions recorded in Scripture when Jesus raised others from the dead. The stanzas for this miracle say this, the ranks of death with trophy grim through ancient streets once trod, and suddenly confronted you, the mighty Son of God. A widow's tears evoked your word, you stopped the bearer's tread. Weep not in pity, then you spoke to her whose son was dead. The ranks of death, the Lord of life, stood face to face that hour, and you took up the age-old strife with words of awesome power. Young man, arise! You ordered loud, and death defeated lay. The widow's son cast off his shroud and strode from death away. Jesus speaks the word, and death gives way to life. The Creator restores what was lost. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, we give thanks to Jesus, our Good Shepherd, whose voice we hear, and who will call us from the grave on the last day. Before we continue in Luke 7, let's hear I Am Jesus' Little Lamb, sung by some second graders at Trinity St. John Lutheran School about four years ago. Now let's go on to the next section of Luke, beginning at verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Are you the one? That's an important question. Think of a young man and woman as they look into each other's eyes on a date. 
Are you the one who will be my lifelong partner? Is she the one? This could be the question asked by the owners of a business. Is she the one who can fill the gap in our staff and help us turn things around? Well, this is the very question that John the Baptist wanted Jesus to answer. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, such as the raising of the young man at Nain. And John called two of his disciples, sent them to the Lord. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, students of the Bible have disagreed about whether these disciples were sent for the benefit of John or for the benefit of John's disciples. John uses the word we in his question, shall we look for someone else? That would seem to mean that both John and his disciples would benefit from Jesus' answer. Think of John's situation. He was in prison, but he'd had an extraordinary life and career up to this point. His birth was miraculous, so wonderful that even his father Zechariah didn't believe it when the angel Gabriel came and announced that God had heard his prayers and that his elderly wife Elizabeth would give birth to a son. Luke 1. When he grew up, he went out into the wilderness. He preached a stern message of the coming judgment of God, coupled with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He proclaimed that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then, just because he was faithfully preaching repentance, even to the king, he was thrown into prison. He had been scolding the king for luring his brother's wife to leave her husband and take up with him instead. In prison, John had lots of time to think. What went through his mind? John was a sinner like us with feet of clay. John had warned the Pharisees and Sadducees that the axe was already laid to the root of the tree. Matthew 3. Did he wonder why God hadn't begun to swing that axe and chop down those wicked trees? John preached that Jesus would come with the Holy Spirit and fire and would separate the righteous from the wicked, the same way a father uses a winnowing fork to separate wheat from the chaff. Did John become impatient because he hadn't seen this take place yet? We just don't know what was going through his mind, but probably the same kinds of things that go through our mind. After all, Jesus says a few verses later, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. In other words, we who live on the other side of the fulfillment of Jesus' work have an advantage over John. We know so much more of exactly what would happen to Jesus and how he would win his victory and that his return to judge the living and the dead is still to come, why it could be any day, we have our doubts. Why shouldn't John have had his doubts? We know that doubt and faith can exist in the same person at the same time. Remember that man who came up to Jesus and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Mark 9. What kind of doubts fill our minds? Do we find ourselves wondering if everything Jesus said will really happen? Is the world really heading for a fiery end when all nations will be gathered before him for judgment? Can I really trust the words of the Holy Bible? Will God really make all things work for my good as he promised? Do I really need to turn away from my wicked thoughts and follow him? I believe that Jesus is real and that he really died on a cross to save me, but often it is hard to believe that I could really be forgiven for all my sins. Are your promises true, Lord? Let's be honest. Have you ever thought those kinds of thoughts? Well, what did John do as he struggled with doubts? He sought the words of Jesus. He was unable to go listen to Jesus, so he sent representatives to speak with Jesus and then report back. What did Jesus say? He didn't answer John with a simple yes or no answer, but gave him much more to think about. And Luke explains, in that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And then Luke tells us Jesus' answer. Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. These words to John and his disciples are not words of scolding, but words that are gently intended to strengthen their faith, to cement their attachment to Jesus in faith once and for all. And these works of which Jesus speaks are not just random miracles. 
Jesus is answering them by referring to the works he was doing, the very works prophesied hundreds of years before. For example, see the checklists in Isaiah 35 and 61. John and his disciples could go down the list and see that Jesus was indeed the one who was promised. Think of it this way. From time to time, the news media put out the description of someone who is wanted. We're given a physical description of the man, including height, eye color, tattoos, or other distinguishing marks. We're told what the man was wearing, what kind of vehicle he was driving, including the license number, if possible, and anything else that might help to locate him. If he was caught on video, that's shown to the public so we can all be on the lookout. Many a crime has been solved when a tip from the public helped locate a criminal. Everyone breathes a sigh of relief when law enforcement says, we got him. He's the one. Fingerprint and DNA evidence further identify the man and bring a conviction to take him off the streets permanently. The Lord God used a similar approach in the sending of his son, the Savior. Before Christ was ever on the scene, God had provided a detailed description of him. The prophets made known many facts about him. They detailed the fact that he would be born of the people of Israel, descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and from the tribe of Judah of the house of David, born of a virgin. Micah tells us he would be born in the city of Bethlehem of Judea. Isaiah describes his suffering with so much detail as though he were an eyewitness himself. There were many shadows of Christ, that is, people or institutions, sacrifices that portrayed in some way who he would be and what he would accomplish. There's no mistaking the details. For example, we have no record of any Old Testament prophet ever giving sight to the blind, but Isaiah says the Messiah would do so. The details were so overwhelming that any believer who knew the scriptures would be able to identify Jesus as the Messiah and say, He is the one. This is why the Old Testament continues to be important for us today. It increases our certainty of Christ as the one and only begotten Son of God long awaited, who came to earth in the fullness of time. This good news is so helpful, not just so that we know our historical facts about who Jesus is, but so that we trust in him, trust in him to roll back and remove the curses that sin and death have put over us and our loved ones. In the public ministry of the Lord Jesus, the curse of death and all its precursors is being rolled back page back in your Bible from this place and you'll see headings like these in Luke. Jesus heals many. Jesus cleanses a leper. Jesus heals a paralytic. A man with a withered hand. Jesus heals a centurion's son. And of course we just read of him raising the young man of Nain. We know that the greatest and final rollback of the curse of sin would be Jesus' own death and resurrection. Scripture says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law and do them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Galatians 3. When Jesus hung there on the cross, he suffered the curse in our place. And by his resurrection from the dead, that work is guaranteed. When we look at the risen Christ, we can say, He is the one. No one else can rescue me from the curse of sin and death as he can and did. I must still suffer through physical death and the things that lead to it, but I will have the victory over sin and its death curse. He is the one, the only one, who can do that. And what about the disciples of John? Well, this is for their benefit too. Remember, John had said, he must increase, that is Jesus, but I must decrease. John 3. In other words, he wanted the disciples and the crowds that came out to hear and see John to go over to Jesus instead. And yet it seems John's disciples were reluctant to follow Jesus. We know, for example, that on one occasion they made common cause with the Pharisees in opposing Jesus, Matthew 9. John wants them to give up following him and instead to become disciples of Jesus. The Lord wants us all to give up following after anyone else besides the Lord Jesus himself, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus concludes his words by telling these messengers, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. 
Jesus was telling John's disciples and John, I may not be the kind of savior you are looking for. Maybe you were looking for a revolutionary to overthrow the Romans and bring glory to Israel. Maybe you were looking for a king who would put you on an earthly throne. I'm a lowly king. I came to suffer and serve and give my life as a ransom for the world. If you will receive this and accept me as such a savior, you will be, will be blessed. Today also there are those who are offended by Christ. There are those things that cause people to stumble in their faith. Some would point to a particularly bitter experience that they've had and say, if there's a loving God, why did he permit these horrible things to happen to me or to someone I love? Others would point to the condition of the church and church institutions and say, I can't be part of a group where people treat each other that way. They see the sad divisions among the churches and the problems within local congregations. They stumble over the presence of Christ and his word and sacraments and say, I can't believe that this group of sinners has anything to do with the coming of the Son of God. Others would like to trade Jesus in for a different savior. They would like someone to rescue them from all their earthly problems in their own way and in their own time. They want to put their trust in one who will make them prosperous and wealthy. To all of us, Jesus says, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Happy is the one who is not offended by a savior who died an ugly death. Blessed is the one who is not ashamed to admit that we needed such a savior to take our place in leading a life acceptable to God. Blessed is the one who is not offended by having to wait to see the fulfillment of God's promises in our bodies. Blessed are those who are not ashamed to find the Savior in the simple means of grace, such as the spoken word of law and gospel, the visible word in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Blessed are they, for they have eternal life. And there's no one else who can give us that gift. Jesus is the key, the only way to salvation. Without him, we are lost eternally. Yes, dear friends, Jesus is the one. He's the one for you. Well, now let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, Nashville, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of the book of Luke at 9 a.m. on V1047. These studies are also available at stjohnsnewminden.org. Just click on Radio Archives in the date. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We thank Ryan and Jessica Spinner who have sponsored this broadcast to the glory of God in thanksgiving for their daughter, Ada Spinner. Today at St. John's we publicly attest and celebrate Ada's baptism, which was performed privately one year ago during the shutdown. Thanks to our partners at WNSV and thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for worship from our sister congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church, Nashville.